we doing? Awesome. Wow. How many of you are thankful to be in this room today? Yeah. Me, me too. It's absolutely unbelievable to get to be in a room full of people the same age and just worshiping Jesus. Um, I started to think about this when Levi was preaching and he was talking about how what happened in the 20s is kind of what ended up establishing what the 30s would look like. And these, we, they didn't really realize that's what it was going to be, but that's what it became. And I started to think about 1997 when he said, in 1997, John Piper, Louis Shelley, all of them were sitting around and they were talking about passion. Well, 1997 was the year I was born. Anybody else? 1997. And so in 1997, they got together and they started praying and they started having a vision. And now we get to step into that vision for something that we didn't even have to build. We just get to step in and worship God. There were seeds planted, there was prayers prayed that now we get to be a part of. And I just want us to recognize that and acknowledge that because what prayers are we praying today and seeds that we're going to sow when we walk out of here that people born this year are going to get to step into and meet Jesus because of. I don't want us to miss that, that this started a long time ago. And I'm excited to be here and I'm honored and I'm blessed. So I just want to pray before, before I share with y'all what I feel the Lord has led me in. Just see what the Holy Spirit does. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for this new year, January 1st, 2020. God, I thank you that you're a God of new beginnings. God, I thank you that you are a God of redemption. God, I thank you that you are a God that goes from glory to glory to glory. And God, I thank you that you invite us into that. God, I pray that how we walk out of here is so different than how we walked in here. God, I pray that although the world might know us as the anxiety generation, the selfie generation, and all these other things, that when we walk out of here, we will be known as a generation carrying the light of the world to everyone in it, the name of Jesus. So God, I pray that you use this moment. Fill me with your spirit to share this word, God. Have your way. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's get started. We're going to start in John chapter 1. I'm going to be reading a few verses. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to John 1. If not, it will be on the screen. Starting in verse 35, it says, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. So a little backstory: John the, John the Baptist, he had been preaching that this Messiah was going to come. That the light of the world was about to come. And so there was a lot of people anticipating this light of the world, this Messiah coming that John the Baptist had been preaching about. He was a man sent from God to say all these things. And so it says the next day John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as Jesus walked by because in this time previously in John 1, it just talks about how Jesus, this Messiah he had been talking about coming, has just came. So it is all going down, finally. So they're standing there. He sees Jesus walks by and he says, behold, the Lamb of God. It says the two disciples heard him say this and so they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and he saw them following and he said to them, what are you seeking? Can everybody say, what are you seeking? Going down a little further, it said, one of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first went and found his brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you, Simon, son of John, you will be called Peter. So we get to see in this text in John chapter 1 when the relationship with Jesus and Peter began. 
We know Peter from a lot of different stories in the Bible. He was the guy that walked with Jesus on the water. He has some pretty epic moments with Jesus. But this is where he was introduced to Jesus by his brother. Well, the way that his discipleship started with Jesus, it says in the Gospel of Mark that one day, Peter and Andrew, they were fishermen and they were brothers and they were fishing. And Jesus walks by and he says, drop your nets, follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. And it says that these two brothers immediately dropped everything that they had and they followed Jesus. And I read these two stories and I'm amazed at how fast they just drop everything, they follow him, they heard it was the Messiah, they followed him. It was like wherever Jesus was, they were magnetic. They followed him. You know, relationships nowadays, a lot of times starts by a follow. But there is a long process that goes from the follow to the actually commitment to being in a relationship with you. But here, there was no process. It was just like, I'm just going to follow you because you're the Messiah. And so I started to think, how did they do that? How was it so immediately? How were they so confident? And I think it goes back to that first question that Jesus hit him with, the second that Andrew started following him, Jesus turned around and said, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? Before we go any further, what are you seeking? And then it goes a little bit further than just that question. It's really the response from Andrew. We get to see what he was seeking because he went and found his brother and he said, we found him. We found the Messiah. The title of my message today is called, The Search is Over. The Search is Over. Because when you know that you found everything that you're looking for, you don't have to seek anywhere else to find it. When you know you found the desire of your soul, you don't have to go and just enjoy the temporary cravings of the world because you're completely satisfied in who he is. They knew, behold, it's the Messiah, drop it all, we're following him. We found what we were looking for. For us, there's a lot more of a process, like I said. I'm not against relationships starting by following and there's a process. Honestly, that's how my relationship started. I'm about to give a lot of hope to a lot of people in the building because Christian and I actually kind of got together because of passion. We were at passion. I wasn't speaking, I was just attending. I love passion, I've been here like four years. Christian was attending and he somehow saw me and so he messaged me on Instagram. And it was a pretty bold message, okay? It's really sweet, it was really kind, told me I was beautiful. But here's the thing, I didn't see that message until two years later. <laughs> so two years go by, never saw this message, and then Christian and I meet, and I'm like, well, he's pretty cute. And so I'm like, I'll give him a follow, right? So I look up his Instagram, I follow him on Instagram, and the second I follow him, I get this little message notification, and I was like, that was really fast. Turns out I was really slow because two years ago he sent me a message that I'm just now seeing. And I'm like, oh, wow, I'm in this, right? So I craft my message and I'm like, sorry for the late reply. <laughs> and so we start, we start the process. Y'all know how the process goes. We start DMing. And then two weeks go by, I kid you not, we had the most stereotypical Christian relationship start. He goes, hey, I'm trying to send you a sermon through DMs, but the link won't go through Instagram, y'all. And listen to what he sent me. He sent me the sermon, single, dating, engaged, married, Ben Stewart. That's right. <laughs> I told you, it was bold, okay? Well, that's how he slid all of the DMs and then continuing on the process, we start texting. But that's not talking. Once we start actually talking on the phone, now we're talking, continuing on the process. Then Christian decides to come up to Nashville and take me on a date. 
we go on a date, but we're not official. There's a process. We start dating, right? And then one day, it was just kind of like, we're official. I'm your girlfriend. You're my boyfriend. Awesome. Moving along the process. And then these three words started coming out. Not the words, not the big words. The, I like you. The kind of like, <laughs> I like you. <laughs> like, I'm so excited that we like each other. Well, I don't know about y'all, if y'all have experienced this process, but it's like there's no pressure in the DMings. It's kind of fun. Then the texting, there's really not much pressure either. Then you're on the phone, you're just like being silly. But then whenever the words, I like you, come out, it's like, I'm kind of nervous now. <laughs> like, you like me, you know? Like, I'm getting weird. And so, like, all of a sudden, like, I start getting nervous when Christian comes into town. Y'all, I start pulling out my A game. I was, like, getting tans when he came in town. Like, I was getting my nails done. I'm not kidding. I'm embarrassed to say, but I'm going to be honest with y'all. I started practicing the dance moves I was going to do in the car on our way to our dates because I wanted to pull it all out. Like, I was like, I'm going to stay in this I like you. But of course, nobody wants to stay in the I like you. You kind of want to get through that phase fast. You kind of rush that phase. And so I think that you rush that phase, except for Christian Huff does not rush that phase. I like you became, I really like you. To, no, 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 I like you so much. Like, now I like you with like six O's so much. I like you so much, he got to the point that it's some kind of crazy. And I remember two months of all of these different ways of saying I like you, I was like, oh, like just say it. Like clearly I don't want to hear I like you again because I feel like there's a little more than that. Because in that I like you phase, although there was interest, there wasn't commitment, right? The definition of like is to be found agreeable, enjoyable, to bring satisfaction. The social media definition of like is to win one's approval. So you can see that to be liked, there's kind of pressure. You feel like you got to be enjoyable. Yeah, I got to be agreeable. I want to win your approval, so I got to pull out everything I got so that I can be liked by you. I remember there was one night, I'm telling you, it was perfect. The sunset was beautiful. We were on the beach on a vacation. Christian looks over at me. It's about two months into this I like you thing. And he says, Sadie Robertson, I got to tell you something. And I'm like, yes. And I'm just like looking in his eyes with the best puppy dog eyes I can possibly give him. And he's like, I like you so much. It's more than like, but I'm not going to say that yet. <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, that night, we ended up having like the best conversation we'd ever had in our relationship. And this conversation was different than a lot of other conversations we had. It wasn't practice. It wasn't cute. It wasn't very agreeable. It probably didn't bring much satisfaction to the ears to hear. It was real. It was raw. It was like hours of tears. And this is what I've experienced. And this is what I've been through to make me who I am today. And it's not pretty and it's not cute, but it's what Jesus has done. And as we begin to talk, we actually truly begin to know each other and something that went a lot further than just being liked by each other. And it was actually the next day that Christian looked at me and he said, Sadie, I love you. Isn't that crazy? That after a moment that wasn't very likable, I got to hear the words, I love you. Eventually, Christian and I decided to commit to a relationship, and we just got married. And yeah, <laughs> it's been awesome. And even though that is so awesome, and I've found the one that I'm going to marry, there was such a process to go through for that. It's a lot different than when you find the desire of your soul. 
There's not a process. They immediately dropped everything they had and they just began to follow him. Because Jesus skips all that phase that we go through. He skips that confusion. He skips the carrying you along. He skips the, wait, what are we doing? And he's like, what are you seeking? He skips the, let's just leave our options open for a little while, see how this works out. He's like, yeah, I know you're a fisherman. Drop your net because I'm going to make you a fisher of men. No other option. I am the option. And he skips that whole I like you phase and he goes straight to I love you. And the thing is, you really know that. You might not have really realized that, but you know that if you know John 3.16. For he so loved you that he sent his one and only son to die for you. And then he so loved you that he died for you. And then he loved you so much that he came back to life and offers you his spirit. If you'll just believe in him, he skipped all of that. You have to do this. He's like, I am love, so I'm just going to come. I love you. I loved you. And sometimes we think that there's a process to go through in order for us to actually commit to a relationship with God. We think we have to go through that whole, well, I don't know if God really likes me because I didn't do this, this, or this. I didn't perform well. I don't read enough. I don't do enough. I've done this and this. We're not waiting on God to like us enough for him to say, hey, Jesus, go. He's not sitting up there in heaven saying, hold up, hold up. Let's wait until the sun hits him just right. Let's wait till golden hour. Let's wait until they say the thing perfect and then I'll send you. He already sent his son. Because before the foundation of the world began, he knew you. He knit you together in your mother's womb so he can skip all that and fully sends it and commit to dying for you while you were still a sinner. It wasn't about you being light. So why did we get that confused? I surveyed Instagram as I was preparing for this message and I said, what are you seeking in life? What are you seeking in life? And I doubled that as a double question. I said, and where are you searching for that in? And I was amazed at the response. Thousands and thousands and thousands of response, literally, and messages and response. All kinds of things because people really took this seriously because they hadn't stopped long enough to think about that. And what people were seeking was actually really powerful. Majority, by far, top four, was love, happiness, peace, and purpose. Top four things that most people my age that follow me on Instagram said they were looking for. And I was like, well, that's that's pretty awesome. But here's the kicker. Where are you searching for that in? That is the response that got me. This year as I was preparing to preach this message as well, I decided I don't want to just go up here and give fluff and not really know what y'all are going on on a heart level. So I went to several college campuses and met with every sorority of the college campuses and I asked them these similar questions. And I said, as an overview of your campus, as somebody who's very liked on campus, What do you see is the thing that people are struggling with the most? And it's interesting because we're searching for all these things, but when I was listening to what everybody on campus seemed to be struggling with, it was these things. Let me see if they sound familiar to you. It was perfectionism, mental illness, depression, anxiety, feelings of loneliness, body image issues, eating disorders, and it was all kinds of things that they would confidently say most people on campus struggle with. I heard this and I was shocked and I've been praying for what what I could say. How do you preach to, to mental illness, to depression, to anxiety, to all these things. And as I'm praying for this, I come across this article by Time Magazine that says, why Instagram is the worst thing for your mental health. 
So I click on the article, very interesting, and it's this whole article about how a group of people have presented to Instagram a request to take the like button away. That's interesting. Of all the things that social media is and has become, the one thing that these people really feel is important to take away is the like button. Well, now you all know that it's coming into play. Already seven countries, they've removed the like button. But the reason why is so interesting. The reason why they're taking the like button away is because it is proven to have direct effect on mental illness, to cause depression, to lead to anxiety, to cause people to feel lonely and left out and FOMO, to cause comparison and eating disorders. And it was every single thing that every sorority girl told me they were dealing with. And so we might be seeking love, happiness, peace, and purpose, but my fear is we're searching for all those things right here. And I don't know if you notice, but you can waste a lot of time searching and searching and scrolling and scrolling and looking, looking with no direction, following and following and following and liking, liking, and liking, and not realize you're not finding anything that you're really looking for. You know, when we were little, you used to play that game, like you would hide something somewhere. Like you'd hide it right here, and you would be directing somebody how to get to that thing. And you'd be like, if they were over here, you'd be like, oh, you're kind of cold, get a little closer. You're, you're a little warmer, but you're still cold. You're a little warmer, oh, you're on, you're on fire, you're on fire, and you get like so stoked. I kind of feel like that right now. It's like we're sitting here with this and we're scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, but we're saying, oh yeah, we're seeking for love, we're seeking happiness, we're seeking peace, we're seeking purpose. And if you're holding this and you're seeking those things, I would say it's really cold. It's ice cold. You are not close right now. And if you would put it down for a second, and you begin to search and say, okay, a little warmer, but if you would pick up this book, I would say you are literally on fire. You're li literally on fire. You know this word, there's a promise in this word, it says seek and you will find. You will find. Because God is love. If you're looking for love, that's who God is. Did you say you're looking for love, happiness, and peace? Let me give you something better. The top three fruits of the spirit of who he is, love, joy, and peace. It's who he is. Oh, and you're seeking for purpose? What better place to find it than from where you come from and who gives you purpose? And your purpose, I think we get confused on that too. We think there's a process to get to our purpose. Once I finish college, then maybe I'll reach my purpose. Once I get to the top of my job, then maybe I'll reach that purpose. We think one day we'll just magically show up. When you find God, when you find love, you find your purpose. Your purpose is to love no matter where you are, no matter what stage you're in, no matter what age you're at, what platform you're on, if you love people and you point them to the love of God, you are fulfilling your purpose. The search is over. Well, if the search is over, then why don't we just commit to a relationship with him? I think some of us might feel like because we messed up our relationship with him. Some of you in here, I wouldn't doubt if you thought that's a great option, but I think I lost that option because I did this, this, and this. I'm going to finish this with how Jesus finished the book of John and the story of Peter. Peter did follow God. He was a great man. He followed God closely, like almost too close. Like he didn't just social media follow him from afar and observe. Like one time he literally walked up on a mountain, heard the voice of God and was like, Jesus, am I supposed to be here? Like that close. They were close. Well, there was this one night where it's kind of all coming to the end. Jesus is washing their feet. They're having an amazing conversation. He's basically telling them what's about to happen. He's laying it down. He's like, don't worry. 
I'm not about to go somewhere. Y'all aren't going to be able to go, but I give you a new command, love one another. He's like trying to make sure it's, it's all good, but you're not going to be able to follow me where I'm about to go. And Peter gets all riled up about this. He's like, what do you mean I'm not going to follow you? Jesus, I would give my life for you. He was so on fire for God. Well, the night goes on, and just a little while later, something's about to happen that Jesus had already told him was going to happen. He said, actually, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter, I'm sure, could not imagine that he would ever deny Jesus three times. And so they go on, and it says all of a sudden, they're praying in the garden, and it says a band of soldiers walks up. Now, a band is something, a group of people who have the same interests and purpose. So there is a group of people coming with the same purpose to arrest Jesus. And watch the boldness of Peter. Peter walks out in front of this band of soldiers. He's like, ride or die, I told you I'd give my life with a sword. Cut your dude's ear off. As you can see, it doesn't seem like anything's about to happen to this relationship until he keeps following Jesus as Jesus gets arrested. He gets all the way up to the door of the courtyard where Jesus is getting arrested and he can't go any further in this. And the Bible says something interesting. It says Peter gets a little cold, gets a little chilly. And I want to make that point because that's normally when it happens. When you get cold is normally when the toughest challenges come. They might not be intimidating. They might not be the band of soldiers, but it's when you're facing doubt. It's when you're facing fear. It's when you're confused on where yours and Jesus' relationship is. And you get a little cold. And Peter's a little cold right now. And he goes and stands by the fire to warm himself. And you can imagine what he's feeling. And it says the servant girl walked up. And he says, weren't you the guy that was with Jesus? And Peter's like, no. And then it says another guy, it was a relative of the guy whose ear he just cut off, says, weren't you the guy that just denied Jesus? I mean, that just walked with Jesus? And he said, no. Like Peter was so bold the night before to cut his cousin's ear off and now he can't even say that he was with Jesus, that he knew Jesus. Somebody else, weren't you the guy that walked with Jesus? And he's like, no, not me. And it says, as soon as the rooster crowed, Peter wept bitterly. He wept bitterly. He messed it up as he must have thought. You might have felt like that. What do I do now? My relationship with Jesus seems really far away now. Jesus went on to die on the cross. He was buried like a dead man in the grave. Peter went and visited me. Like, what do I do now? I just messed it up. How do I get back to that relationship? Don't worry. If you feel like that, the way Peter was feeling. It says, Peter, what he did was that. He didn't go running, he didn't go do anything. He went back fishing, which is what a lot of us do. We just go back to what we knew before we were in relationship with Jesus. We try to go back to the party. We try to go back to the likes. We try to go back to the drinking, back to the relationship, back to the sex. And we try to just think, maybe this will just numb us. Maybe it'll just fill us up enough. But just like Peter, he kept pulling out that net and it was empty. He caught nothing. You're catching nothing. And even if you caught something, you'd be right back on the boat the next day looking again because it would not fill you up. And he's out there. and He didn't do anything to get back to Jesus. Jesus shows up where he's at. Right where he's at, fishing once again. And Peter was so excited. He jumped out of the boat. He actually stripped. Don't do that if you get excited. He stripped. He jumps in the water. He swims up. He's like, yes. And Jesus is like, let's have breakfast. And guess where they're about to have breakfast around? A charcoal fire. Doesn't that happen? That might have happened to you last night. You get in the presence of Jesus and you're reminded of what it's like to have a relationship with Jesus. And you're so excited. And you're like, yes. And then you're reminded of your past. You're reminded 
of what you just did and you do what so many people have asked me in this moment. I've been to juvie, prisons, churches, colleges, middle schools, high schools, and I get this question everywhere I go. Sadie, because of what I've done, before I even think about going and having this thought about a relationship with Jesus, I need to ask you, do you think he still loves me? Do you think he still loves me? Do you think I should even try? Is there still a purpose for me? Is there still this option for me because of what I've done? And so what you would think would be happening is that Peter would be wondering, I wonder if he still loves me. I wonder if there's even a relationship left here. I wonder all these things. But let's read what actually happened. John 21, when they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, tend my sheep. And he said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Notice something. That went way different than what we probably would have thought would have happened. You see, What we wonder, what we ask when we mess up is, I wonder if God still loves me. And so you would think Simon Peter, after denying him, would come up to Jesus and be like, Jesus, do you still love me after what I did? But it wasn't Peter asking Jesus the question. Jesus was asking Simon Peter the question, do you? love me. The question didn't have to come from Peter because Peter knew Jesus loved him. There was no question about it when a man he walked with died on the cross, rose from the grave, and after knowing he was going to deny him because he already said he would, he showed back up to where he was at and cooked him breakfast. He loved him. He died for him just like he does you. God's love is not confusing. It's not something you have to wonder about. It's not something you have to worry about losing because he is love. His love is from the beginning to the end. The Bible says about love, it bears all things, perfect love. It hopes all things, it believes all things, it endures all things. It never fails because that is who God is. Very different than I like you. The I like you would be about you doing something to be liked. The I love you is about the person of love, who he is, giving of himself to you. You don't do a thing. He just is that good. The question is, do you love him. And then he finishes it just like he started. After he establishes that he loves him, because he's basically saying what Dr. John just said, just you need to decide right now that I am the desire of your soul. That you're not going to go have to go out and seek anything else that might satisfy you. I'm going to fill you up. Do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Met him with love gave him his purpose and ended it like this, follow me. Don't go searching anywhere else, I will give you your direction, follow me. So I wanna ask you passion and this is how we're gonna end it. Because there's a love language called words of affirmation. Sometimes you just need to affirm some things in your relationship because the enemy is going to want to steal those things and make you question and make you wonder. Peter was like, you know this. You know I love you. But yet Jesus did it three times because he's like, we need to redeem some things. The three times you deny me. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Okay, it's affirmed. Follow me. Let's move on. So today I want to affirm, I want you to affirm your relationship with Jesus. So that when you walk out of here, you don't question anymore. You don't go out searching for things from the world that only he can give you. And you don't go out searching for things from him that he's already given you. So I'm going to ask that everybody closes their eyes and get in this moment with Jesus. Actually think about 
Address the thoughts that you've been having about your past. Many people want to bail right before the breakfast because like I said, the presence of Jesus begins to remind you of your past, but only so that he can redeem it. His grace is so good. He doesn't shame you. He loves you. Address those things. And now let's affirm some things as you sit here. I'm going to ask you the question that Jesus asked Peter. Do you love me? And after I pose that question, I would like to really for you to hear yourself respond to that and affirm that. Yes, Lord, I know that I love you. So I'll ask the question, and then I just ask that you respond, even if you've been a Christian your whole life or if you just came to Christ. If you want to affirm this relationship and establish this so that you can move forward into a relationship that doesn't get cold because you're filled with the spirit of who he is. Next time we saw Peter, it was Acts when he led the church. He was known by his courage. He healed people as he walked past them because he was filled with the Spirit of God and following his direction. In this moment, let's establish something so you don't look to the left, you don't look to the right, and you don't look back. Do you love me? I'm gonna say it one more time. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love me. Uh, you know that I love you. And you did this as many times this week as you need to. Every time the enemy challenged you with your past, you say, I know that I love him. And I know that he loves me. So do you still love me? And follow him. God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for relationships that are established today that they won't have to go searching for anything else in the world that only you can give. I praise you today that today people found the fullness of love, the fullness of joy, the fullness of peace, their absolute purpose because today they found you and the search was over. It is in your mighty, holy name we pray. Amen.